Welcome back. 34 minutes past the hour. Tom Hartman here with you live from the Conservative Political Action Conference, CPAC. And sitting right across from me, my old friend and debating partner, Peter Ferrara. Hey, Peter. As I always say, glad to be here. I'm not sure about that right now, but uh, <laughs> that's, my, that's it's, my signature line. It's, uh, it's <laughs> very nice to have you in, in, in person. Uh, Peter works with the Heartland Institute. Heartland.org is the website. He's the Director of Entitlement Budget Policy. And you're working on win-win entitlement reform. Whenever I hear entitlement reform coming out of the mouths of conservatives, like yourself, no offense. Uh, in fact, I, I think you're probably quite proud of it. It usually, when you drill down into it, means poor people are going to get less. Well, that's exactly what I'm trying to counter. That's what I mean by win-win entitlement reform. Okay. Our entitlement programs are so old, outdated, uh, poorly constructed that you can, in fact, reform them by proven reforms that have already shown that they can work in the real world to actually provide better benefits and income for the poor and for seniors while saving taxpayers 50% or more. Does this involve uh, handing them off to the banks? No, not. I, I don't know how you hand off somebody to a, well, to does, a bank. But well, you, you privatize them. I mean, you know, it's, it's like Paul Ryan. He wants to voucherize Medicare. He wants to turn it over to the health insurance companies. Is that the sort of reform you're talking about? Or well, are you talking well, about actually changing the government programs but keeping the government as the, in, as the group that writes the checks? <laughs> well, it, it won't really – it's not the best for the poor if the government's the group writing the checks. But uh, we – for example – So the 19- banks would be better. Banks would be better? No, I'm not – actually, banks have uh, – well, Wall Street I mean, would be better. Well, that depends on what reform you're talking about. But I'll use, for example, the 1996 welfare reform, mm-hmm. where they block granted the uh, one uh, old AFD, one old New Deal welfare program, the old Aid to Families with Dependent Children program, AFDC, back to the states. Right. And they said to the states, uh, "You now have authority. We've sent this. We're going to send the federal funding back to you in a in a fixed finite block grant. Previously, the funding was federal funding was provided." in a way that called matching, under a matching formula. The more the state spent, the more the federal government would send to the state. Right. And that was effectively paying the states to spend more, which they were glad to do as long as the federal government was paying them to do it. So well, they, the, had to, they had to do it within certain guidelines. I mean, they had to demonstrate that they actually had poor people. I mean, there was a reason why Mississippi was getting more of that money than was, you know, a wealthier, smaller in a state like Rhode Island. Well, they had to sign up more poor people for welfare to get the money, but they're sure. glad to do that as long as the federal government was paying them to do that. But they, well, what's what, wrong with that? What, what, well, it gives you the incentive to, to spend, sign up more, poor people. spend more than is necessary. So what they did with the reform is they said, okay, now you're going to get a fixed finite amount uh, from the federal government. Uh, if you spend more, that's got to come 100% out of your pocket. But if you get people out to work and you spend less, then uh, then you can keep the savings. Sure, but what so if there's no work? That Well... What, the, what happened was that transformed the incentives, and within a couple of years, two-thirds of the people on that program nationwide actually went to work. Yeah, well, that's because we, we had 3% unemployment. We, had an, we, we were in the middle of an economic bubble, but when the, when the bubble burst, those people, there was no safety net to catch them because AFDC had been destroyed. I'm going to show you, I'll surprise you in a minute, and show you an area of agreement, but let me finish what they did in 96 first. Okay. And they, uh, uh, so in 96... They, they changed the reform incentives for the state bureaucrats administering the programs. The states went from he and heavy, he's my brother, to you guys got to get out and go to work. And so actually, uh, even though the liberals said these people can't work, they can't support themselves, within a couple of years, two-thirds of the people who were dependent on that program left the program and actually went to work. Mm-hmm. Their incomes were documented to increase by 25%. Uh, poverty dropped precipitously, particularly uh, – uh, poverty among black children. These are documented results. I'll give you one book, Work Over Welfare, by uh, Ron Haskins at the Brookings Institution, documented uh, these results. But, but Peter, you can't ignore the fact that we were in the middle of a bubble. All that stuff went in the actual, in the opposite direction in 2008, 2009, 2010, when we, we, when we went into a depression, basically. That was, yeah, caught, I've written extensively about that. That was, of course, caused by the government, caused by the Federal Reserve. Well, and whoever by, causes and it, by the point is, the, but, okay, but you know, so, Clinton's so reform of welfare set up yeah, a disaster well, for people when the business cycle crashed. Well, it, well the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the business, when you crash the uh, economy, that's going to hurt everybody. But, you know, as I discuss in my book where I'm discussing this reform, here's my idea for win-win okay. welfare. Send, expand that successful program to all the federal means-tested welfare programs. There's another 200 federal means-tested welfare programs. We're going to spend $10 trillion on those programs over the next 10 years. Block grant it back to the states. And what should the states do? The states then have that money. They have the authority. Completely new welfare system. So here's my new welfare system for you, Tom. You, in fact, are in agreement with this. 
I would have a welfare system that would eliminate poverty uh, categorically with a guaranteed offer of work. Under our federal, uh, under the current federal minimum wage, uh, that plus the earned income tax credit plus the child tax credit, if you work uh, full time year round, you will. Uh, how you every family will be out of poverty. They will earn enough to get out of out of poverty, and so the federal, so the state government, I recommend should say to them, you come to this welfare office before nine in the morning, and we guarantee you eight hours of work at the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. We guarantee you. We'll so you're saying the government should be the employer of last resort. Uh, yeah, under this proposal, if they can't find, they will try to operate like uh, these temp agencies and give you an assignment Sure. Uh, for the, to work for the day. I'm a big fan of the government as employer find... of the last resort. That was the cornerstone of the New Deal. Well, you, you in fact, indicated you, you've once You've become before, a liberal here, Peter. You've indicated once before that you uh, support this. Now, see, that transforms the incentives because there's no more disincentive to work from welfare because right. you have to work. Franklin you Roosevelt have... said the best welfare program in the world is a job. So if you did a program like that, what I think would happen is that uh, millions of people who are now dependent on the government would go to work just like they did in 1996. Okay. And, but, and they would but you do want to keep jobs. something in place for people who I, can't they, work. I, yes, I don't, I don't believe in human suffering. So there should be a safety net under all circumstances to pe prevent people from starvation, from a lack of housing, uh, from, from, from suffering due to lack of medical care. And if you do the uh, incentives right so you don't create unnecessary dependency, it won't cost much. In our rich society, it doesn't cost much to help people in need as long as you're not creating need by paying people to be poor, which is what the old system did. This is surprisingly rational, Peter. I don't, I don't mean surprisingly like from you, but I'm, I'm – yeah, it's, it's quite rational. So I see. I believe in safety nets for everybody okay, uh, so, in circumstances so, where they are so truly in need. Moving, but don't create need and then burden the taxpayers. Yeah. With them. Uh, the, the the one area where I think I might dispute your suggestion is that you're saying that you think that state bureaucrats are better and less corruptible than federal federal bureaucrats. Block grant. Block grants to the states rather than federal programs. Well, the thing is that and, they we and, changed and, their incentives with the way we structured the block grants, and so that's the key to the future. No, People but still, you're, you're, you're going to you're going to you're going to turn over to state bureaucrats instead of federal bureaucrats. And, yes, because they can. Because my experience has been the state bureaucrats are more corruptible than federal bureaucrats. Well, you know they're, they they the, certainly have a lot less scrutiny. Well, the same people vote for state officials that vote for federal officials. So if you think they can handle the responsibility of voting for President of the United States, then they can handle the responsibility of voting for the governor. If you think they can handle the responsibility of voting for U.S. senators and congressmen, they can handle the responsibility of voting for state legislators. So yeah. uh, There's some states in this country that are notoriously corrupt. I mean, it's just... Well, you know, they, I don't see a lot of corruption in the, on the welfare side of things, yeah. uh, but you do have uh, corruption at the federal level. You have programs that the feds administer that have huge amounts of documented we waste, have, fraud, and abuse. And sure. We have, we, have, we, have, we have three minutes before we've got to take a break. So yeah. you, you had said before when we were talking off the air, you, you had said that I made the same mistake that Karl Marx did in saying that capital is not productive. Yeah, you, you seem to think that capital makes no contribution to production. Let me make it very clear. Okay. I think that capital does make a contribution to productivity. And capital plays an important role in our society. My point is that somebody who earns their living with capital should pay the same income tax rate as somebody who earns their living with labor, with I work. agree with that 100%. They should so, be the same tax rate. They shouldn't be so, taxed three or four times. And capital so, so what I'm saying is do, a, you know, with do away with the capital gains but loophole you you and, and no. have capital gains tax, taxed. So, so Paris Hilton, sitting on her butt around the pool, earning her living with capital is paying the same tax rate that you or I are we're earning our living with our minds or our bodies. Capital gains tax is a double tax. So to have the same tax as on labor, tax. You, you ta capital gains tax should be zero. Well, labor tax is, is a triple gains, tax. Capital gains tax is on top of uh, the corporate income tax. It's on top of the individual income tax. It's on top of the death tax. And I don't believe in multiple taxation of labor income either. So uh, uh, you can have a general reduction in taxation across the board. I mean, if you want to use that argument, every dollar... It's that, a standard argument. Every stuff, dollar, I didn't make it up no, myself. I, I, mean, I know, and it's, and it's, it's a, sta and it's a standard taxation nonsense. taxation of capital. Every dollar that comes into my program that I use to pay, to pay my employees, every single dollar of that came from a company that had paid taxes on it. So it's already been taxed. So I shouldn't have to pay taxes, no, right? No, no. See, the thing is that a capital is a, a, the present. What is the capital value of a, of an asset? It's the present value of the future discounted value of the future income stream. That income stream is going to be taxed when it's earned. So if you tax the capital value, you're taxing that future income, same income stream twice. You see, when, they, when you're talking about what comes into your company, uh, that's a new income stream to you, and so that should be taxed once. 
but with the capital gain inherently taxes the same income stream no, twice. No, the capital gain. If, if, I, if I go out and I buy a bunch of Marriott stock and I'm sitting around on my butt waiting for the dividend check to arrive, you know, I didn't pay t- taxes on that money that I used to buy that yes, Marriott you did. The stock. Ta- it's the, the corporate income I mean, tax. I did, you, I, I did yeah, pay that, taxes on that money. I bought it with after, after tax and, money, and but, when, but it's, it's the same thing as if, you know. The capital gain arises because people think that the future income stream to that capital is going to increase. That income stream is going to be yeah. taxed when it's earned. So you, you may not have heard of the tax on dividends. But in addition to the capital gains, they pay tax on dividends, and the corporation pays another tax on that same income stream. So the same and income the, stream is taxed and three the, times. And the in corporation that is paying on the income stream that it's using to pay salaries as well. It's paying on the in- yes, it is. It's paying three times on the income stream to the corporation because capital is. So it's a it, nonsense it, it, argument. No, it's multiple taxation of capital, and it's working people that lose because they, if they don't have the capital investment, jobs are not created. They don't have the tools to be more productive, and wages uh, don't go up as fast. They actually. De- can decline rather than rise. Which so you disagree with you disagree with Ronald Reagan. Re- Reagan made capital gains and regular ordinary income exactly the same, twenty eight percent. Reagan agrees with me. That's why he hired me to work at the White House. Okay, <laughs> Peter Ferrara.